Today on Dining with the Contessa, we are going to be exploring how glassware can improve the look and use of your dinner table. So if you're new to my channel, I'm the Creative Contessa and I am your quintessential Renaissance woman. My tastes and thrives and passions are extremely esoteric and cover literal millennia. So today we're going to be focusing on the Middle Ages, specifically the 14th through, well technically the 17th century in terms of tableware. This is our object today. And this is called a gutteral or a kutterolf or a kutrolf, several other um, various perversions of that particular pronunciation in German. This is a flask for water or wine, and it has many splendid uses. Let's talk a little bit about the history though first. This kind of glass blowing is known as forest glass, and you can tell it's part of that tradition because it is green. It has a green tint. This glass, for instance, is even more so green. And it is this color not on purpose, but because the quartz that is utilized in its manufacture is not pure. And at this time, they didn't have the technology to purify it or and or it was just too expensive to do so. So for that, it is called forest glass or Waldglas in German, but also because Glass blowing requires an immense amount of fire, and in the Middle Ages, in fact, any pre-industrial era, that required either charcoal or wood, both of which are more readily available in the forest than in town. And so frequently, and most often, glass blowers would set up their shops in the middle of the forest, hence forest glass. Um, and here you can see this charming picture of these very not foresty looking people blowing glass. Um, that's because it's a representation of ancient Roman glass blowing as of the 15th century. So, glass blowing a la antica. One of the benefits of this type of flask is supposedly that if one lays it on its side, liquid will not come out. I'm attempting to demonstrate that here, but apparently either my flask is faulty or I'm faulty as a user. Or perhaps I overfilled it. Either way, while I continue to play, I thought I'd mention a fun heraldry fact. Glass blowing was such a key industry in many places in Central Europe that it actually made its way into heraldry. As you can see here, the arms of the town of Heidebrücken in Germany actually incorporate a Kutrol right into their design, along with the glass blowing works itself and a symbol of the forest, that being the oak leaves. Mischief managed, moving onward. Flasks like these were actually manufactured as early as the third century. And we actually have documentation of them being manufactured in Cologne, which at that time, that was Colonia uh, in the Roman Empire. So it was a big Roman city with all of the amenities, including glass blowing. And so you can see here is a picture of actually a third century exemplar. And you can see there's some similarities and some differences, but the general shape is the same. The reason it's called the Kotorov, Kotorov, or the Guteral, it actually comes from the Latin gutur and gutis, so they think it's sort of a two for one in terms of etymology. That refers specifically to the sound it makes when it pours, it makes a gurgling sound, and we're going to hear that in a moment. And so that onomatopoeic implication has been uh, basically incorporated into the name for this particular flask. It has um, several benefits to it, it's very sturdy, and so for that reason, it was actually used as a riding flask because you could tie something around its neck here and then hang it off of your belt or your saddle and carry it around with you. And I'm not certain how thrilled the horse was about that, but whatever, it's just a horse, I suppose. So let's demonstrate this gutural in action. So here's modern glass bottle of wine, right? Here is our flask. So when you, if you're going to get one of these, and I do recommend it, angle it to the side so that the pointed, you can see there's a curve. You want the curve pointed down a little bit. And you're going to, you can hear the gurgling sign coming from that bottle. And as it pours in, you can see that it's actually aerating. So this, the system of tubes, which is also one of the characteristics of this style of glass blowing. These little tubes on the neck aerate the wine as it goes in and then as it goes out. So it definitely allows the flavors to start developing. 
The other remarkable thing about these flasks is they look small, and then you fit a whole bottle of wine in them. <laughs> and the bottle in this case is this. Let's see if I manage to not spill it all over myself. Ah, good job. Okay. This is a 500 milliliter, 750 milliliter bottle of wine. So 750 milliliters fits in this beautiful flask. So quite nice. Now let's go ahead and get an ear for that characteristic gurgling sound. And that's plenty for the Contessa. I'm a lightweight. Unfortunately, I did not pour as neatly as my sommelier would, my wine steward, but... <laughs> and this also allows me to dilute my wine with the characteristic one half, although I think probably in the practice of Duke Philip the Good of Burgundy, we will probably be actually doing one fourth wine to three fourths water, because that's how much he diluted his wine, and it allowed him to be one of the most puissant princes of Europe. So you've seen the practical uses of this flask. It's also, of course, quite elegant and beautiful. And there are several places where you can procure these. There are a few glass blowers in the United States that actually do craft this. And there are several in Europe. Most of the ones in Europe are in the Czech Republic or Slovakia. And if you find vendors outside of those areas selling them, they're just reselling items from the glass uh, factories in the what would be former Eastern Bloc, Eastern Europe now. Um, if you want to check out links, I put some in the quotes. Damn it. Not the quotes. In the details. I put some in the details for you. That's only if you're interested. I'm not getting any money from any of them. So recommendations are just based on what I found. I have not actually purchased the glass from any of these because I bought this flask in 2005 at a medieval market, actually a medieval encampment, living history encampment in Germany called Freienfels, sort of northwest of Frankfurt. 2005, long time ago. And I have no idea who that vendor was, honestly. So, but I can attest for its longevity. I have had this for 16 years. It has literally traveled the world with me. And I do mean around and around by plane packed in my luggage and look, it survived completely unscathed. So stability and durability attested. Well, my highly professional, highly trained, highly skilled water steward has provided me with the water my wine needs. See, look at that livery. <laughs> and so now I'm going to enjoy my wine. But if you have enjoyed today's video, and please, please, please don't forget to like and subscribe if you haven't subscribed already. And if you would like to actually support me more actively, please do become a patron on Patreon. I'm always happy to keep creating, but I do need some support for that. So if you feel you can, excellent. If not, then just like and subscribe. And please, in the comments below, if you are interested in seeing any particular video on a subject of any of the range of subject matter that I cover, whether it's on some other piece of diningware or medieval life or something more active and tutorial in nature. Put it in the comments below. Thank you for watching. Stay creative. <laughs>